Good morning. I got to tell you off the top that I made one trip on a fish boat, a halibut boat in the Gulf of Alaska. Terrified to death I was. And I know the dangers of fishing, but who understands the complexities of what seems to be the perennial crises in the fishing industry in British Columbia? It's worth at least $400 million a year to the people of BC. For instance, on Sunday, the herring fishermen are out after a $100 million bonanza. But apart from that, we're going to talk about the herring at $1,250 a ton, if you can believe it. We're going to talk about licensing. We're going to talk about border warfares with the United States, OK on the East Coast, a mess on the West Coast still. And we're going to try and have a look at this Combine's investigation inquiry into the Fisherman's Union. Because I've got the impression right now that Wapniaski and the boys are the most evil people. I'm not quite sure about that, but that's the impression I get. And I may well confirm that impression, or you may or may not, with some of my guests this morning, starting with Jack Nickel, who is the president of the United Fishermen and Allied Workers Union, and with George Hewison, who is the secretary of that same august labor organization. <laughs> Later in the program, we'll be hearing from Mike Forrest, spokesman for the Pacific Gill Netters Association, and Dick Williams of the Pacific Trawlers Association. Now, how we're going to handle this, I'm not quite sure, but the right way to start it, because they seem to be the boys in the eye of all the storms at the moment, is with Messrs. Nickel and Hewison of the United Fishermen and Allied Workers Union. I'm sitting here giggling, but there's nothing to laugh about in the fishing industry because it seems to go from chaos to crisis to crisis to chaos. And I'm going to start with Jack Nickel, president of the United Fishermen and Allied Workers Union. First time I've interviewed you, Jack. That's right. Many have celebrated Barney over the years with Homer. That's right. I've listened to some of the programs with a lot of interest. Tell me, is Homer, did, did he finally get out in the fishing grounds? Oh, yes. He's been fishing now for the last two years and doing very well. No, I mean the last two days. Oh, the last two days. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Uh, yes, I believe he's left for the grounds, but he did appear one day before the combines. Yes, uh, after a little bit of a tussle. No, I think it was uh, a matter of he was preoccupied with getting ready for fishing and just okay. didn't have time. Jack, uh, I want to try and understand. Why are the Combines people after you? What are they trying to prove against you? Well, since it's the second time that they've been after us, I guess it must be something of a crusade with them. Uh, we were given an exemption, uh, at least in, in the late 1950s, when the Combines started to investigate our union, there was a moratorium declared by Parliament uh, on the investigation, and it was dropped. And uh, that moratorium, uh, at least just the substance of it, was written into the Competition Act now, or the, the Combines Act. Nevertheless, we find that we're being investigated again. But this is precisely the problem. We don't know why. They won't tell us. Are you or are you not a trade union under the definition of many of the Act in the Canada Labor Code? Not only in the Canada Labor Code, but the province of British Columbia. No, you are. Yes, very definitely. You and are a union. Well, the... the, the are you uh, certified the as a union? For shore workers and, uh, and tendermen, we are the certified bargaining agent. But okay, the, what about fishermen? Well, we're not certified, but we're nevertheless the well-established bargaining agent for, as, right. for many classes of fishermen. Well, that's good of you to put that to me. I mean, you, you come under the provincial labor code and you are... You, do, you don't have to be certified to be a, a, a bargaining okay. representative. No, but the point I'm making is that you're certified under the provincial labor code for bargaining for tendermen and shore workers. That's right. You're not certified under the Canada Labor Code, although you feel that you have a well-established, uh, perhaps a legal exemption, and a well-established traditional exemption as the bargaining agent for fishermen. I don't think it's a matter of an exemption. You see, in the, in the British Columbia Labor Code, you do not have to be certified in order to be the bargaining representative. We're not, we're not the certified bargaining agent for all of the units of shore workers or tendermen that we represent. But the battle that they're trying to prove against you is that you are free enterprise fishermen on a share or other basis, and that when you bargain, negotiate prices, you're really negotiating them in restraint of trade. I think that is a, a concept that the Combines people have, and that's why I say it's something of a crusade. We talked with some of the people. Uh, uh, John Monroe, when he was Minister of Labor, he arranged a meeting with uh, some of the people from the Restrictive Trade Practices Commission in the Combines branch, and it's, obviously they have, it's obvious they have all kinds of hang-ups as to the status of the United Fishermen and Allied Workers uh, Union as a trade union. But 
I think the laws of the land are very, very clear now that, uh, you know, we have every right to exist as a trade union. Yeah, but back to the, this other point, which has been thrust down my throat by people from the other side, that you are not as such certified, a certified trade union for the men who go out on the boats. We have no certificates of bargaining authority. For well, is that not your weakness? No, because as I say, you do not have to have uh, a, a certificate in order to be a bargaining agent. Our, yeah, contracts, our contracts set that out. But they can't interfere with you on the shore workers and the tendermen because you're certified under the Provincial Labor Bargaining Court. And, Labor I, Court. and I submit they cannot interfere uh, with our bargaining relationships. Yeah, but I think that's a good exchange, George, because it helps people to understand that maybe what Neaski and company, <laughs> I shouldn't be using his name for freely, but they have some color of right to go after you because you may be in restraint of trade. Well, I think you can perhaps justify anything, but I think Jack makes the point that it's a crusade, and I think it's mainly because of the, a lot of the other activities of the union in a lot of other areas, federal, you know, the fact that we've been an outspoken critic of the federal government on many occasions, I think that you could see uh, that they're uh, interested in the, well, the dismantling or dismemberment or the weakening of uh, this you trade mean union. You mean you're a political enemy of the government in power? Well, we, we don't choose to be a political enemy, but we have our differences. And, uh, you know, we've stood up and opposed a West Coast oil port and we're very effective. Uh, people said it couldn't be done, uh, that, it, uh, you know, you can't take on the big oil companies. We've stood up and said we're not going to surrender our West Coast boundaries, and we've been successful. Uh, we've stood the government to a standstill, a little organization of something like 7,000 members. And I could see where the Federal Combines branch would be very interested in a crusade to destroy the effectiveness okay. of this organization. Okay, talk about 7,000 members. It would seem to me that uh, you do not have solidarity on the West Coast by any manner of means. I mean, here we've got the PGA, we've got the PTA, we've got the Native Brotherhood, with whom you used to be at loggerheads. You know, you've had many a dispute with them. So what does the UFAWU in fact represent in terms of, of the proportion of the fishing fleet on the West Coast? 25%? No, no, more than that. We represent uh, a large segment of the gillnet fleet. Uh, we have some trollers, but uh, by no means uh, a significant portion of the, of the troll fleet, although we represent a lot of troll gear if we include the combination boats. We represent uh, most, well, a good uh, section of the seine boat fleet, uh, the uh, longliners, the halibut fishermen that you were speaking of, and the trawlers as well as the uh, shore workers, the bulk of the shore workers in the industry, and the tenement. That's where you have your clout, of course, isn't it? If you have a dispute on the high seas with anybody you, and you declare something hot, whammo, the shore workers and the tenement won't touch it. That's your clout. Or we have the situation where we have uh, the fishermen, the shore workers and the tenement all stand up. The shore workers or tenement get into a jackpot. The fishermen historically have always come to their support. And, you know, any one of the sections get into difficulty, the strength of the organization as an industrial organization lies in that they all stick together. You know, but you bet your guys make such big money, it's hard to think of them as oppressed uh, workers. Well, that's the, that's the eh? part of the industry that is sensationalized. There may... Well, how can you sensationalize $1,250 a ton for herring? Well, you've got to catch it first, and uh, we're going to split... We're going to divide uh, <coughs> about 58,000 tons of herring up among uh, 120 companies, which works out to about 438 <coughs> tons per company. And uh, there's a lot of competition with something in the order of 1,300 gill netters uh, right. and two men to a gill net, that's 2,600, and uh, about 200 sane boats. And we're looking at 1,200 men there. And when you divide that pie up, it's, uh, it's not all that much per person. But no, remember no. this, if the companies are going to pay $1,250 a ton or more to the fishermen, mm -hmm. imagine what it is that they're getting for the row from the Japanese. It's what the reason why BC Packers are declaring profits of nine million dollars. Agreed, five or six thousand dollars a ton for the oil, whatever it is they get in Japan. That's right, and so all well, we do is. Let's stop there for a minute. If you hadn't had this, when did this herring bonanza appear? I mean, I remember when you fished for herring. Seventy-two, and then seventy-three had gone underway. What were the prices game. in seventy-two? Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. I think we started thirty some odd dollars a ton. Thirty dollars a ton. Thirty dollars a ton, and last year they were paying up to what eighteen hundred dollars a ton cash. In the Gulf for herring. Uh, 1,200, I, I think, 12 to 1,300. 12 to 1,300. Uh, so you brought in you, the industry. The guys in the industry picked up maybe 100 million last year in cash. Without that, where would the fishing industry have been in British Columbia they, last they year? They would have been in very difficult straits. The, most fishermen estimate they get a quarter of their total earnings out of the, out of the herring fishery. It's and not going to last very long. Am I right in looking at both of you and the gillnetters and the trollers very suspiciously and saying, 
given a free hand, you'd fish out every bleeding herring in the oh, sea. No, I, think, I think you see that's wrong because uh, Would you? in 1967, they had to close down the, the herring fishery uh -huh. because it had been overfished. Now, people from the fishery service still deny that's the case. They say there were other biological factors. But it was the fishermen that shut the industry down. The fishery service insisted on opening the herring fishery in January of 1968 after the Christmas layup. And our own men said, we're not going to go out fishing. The resource is in trouble. And uh, the co-op fleet went out and proved that it was in trouble. They couldn't catch enough herring to pay for their fuel. And it was shut down until 1972. And more importantly, the fishermen were the ones that warned the government earlier. If they well, took the quotas well, off, the, the herring stocks were going to be difficult. The unrestricted fishing in the 60s very nearly wiped out the herring on the West Coast. That's right. As it was wiped out in the East Coast, yes. was it not? Next, we're going to talk about too many boats to chasing too few fish and who all the boats are and how we can solve it. I've got my solution. Of course, I've often put it to Homer. The only efficient way to catch fish is to net the mouths of the river, you know, take out the fish you need and let the others go up to spawn. But it would do you our jobs and them. That's right. But that's the way it'll be done one day. Well, yeah. we've never talked about efficiency in this industry. That's never been no, the name of the it's a free <coughs> enterprise industry, George. You, you right? wouldn't catch halibut the way you were catching him with uh, one hook and a line either. And 24 miles a gear. That's right. And 80 yeah. mile an hour winds. I wouldn't do that for $1,000 a pound. Webster, Hewis and the Nickel on licensing next. Later, the gill netters and the trollers after this break. <laughs> Back to Jack Nickel on the combines. Now, you certainly have an image as a union of being tough, aggressive, and a little bit arrogant. You would agree with that, wouldn't you? Not arrogant, but tough. Tough aggressive. and aggressive, right? And uh, how can you get in there when you're summoned in front of a, a, a properly constituted combines investigation and say, no, not going to answer the question. To hell with you. Or what's to that effect? How dare well, you get away with that? Just because you've got a lot of political clout and they're afraid of losing votes? Not at all. Uh, the law doesn't, in our opinion, uh, require us to answer questions in the area that they were asking them. Uh, and uh, that is a recent decision of Justice Addy in the federal court. We uh, uh, looked at the initiating order that set up this investigation. It's an investigation into the production and sale and transport of fish. And any time we protested the Combine's investigation to the Minister of Consumer and Corporate Affairs, he said it's an investigation into the industry and you're just simply an integral part of it. And so. Some of your activities are of interest to us. But uh, uh, we, we went there quite prepared to answer questions and did answer questions. I was on the stand for two and a half hours a answering questions about the production and the sale and transport of fish. But when they started to inquire into matters relating to the activities of the union or activities of combinations of workmen and employees. Sample question. Give me a question you wouldn't answer. When they came down to the point, uh, uh, they wanted to look at some 1971 strike rules and ask what do we mean by hot fish and what do we mean by clear fish. And uh, my position was that was not a subject for examination in this investigation. Uh, we've accused the government, the Combines branch, the companies, of attempting to smash the union. And I think we only have to look to the United States where there was at one time an industrial union of some 25,000 members representing various sectors of the, of the fishing industry and uh, that organization was smashed by the Sherman Antitrust Laws, which is the U.S. equivalent of the Combines Act. And today, uh, that union is fragmented into small little organizations. They have no contracts, no right to sign agreements, uh, share agreements, price agreements, uh, no right to the normal trade union activities at all. And obviously, the companies here in Canada would dearly love to have that same well, thing. Well, naturally, because they're all Canfisco and B.C. <laughs> Packers and Weston, and they're all massive conglomerates who control the input. In fact, the Japanese uh, offshore buyers or whatever they are are very handy for you right now, aren't they? Well, they're very handy That's for... That's the reason you're getting $1,250 a ton for herring, isn't it? Isn't well, it? it's the Japanese buyers, uh, obviously, with the you markets see, that exist in you've Japan. You've got a uh, strong case for your traditional unit, but it's such a free enterprise business. Well, is it? Yeah. Let's see. Look, look at the production. I mean, don't, most, Let me, of, let's get don't on. most of you guys fish on shares? Let me give you an example of how free yeah. enterprise it is, Jack. BC Packers controls 40% of the production. Canadian Fish controls 28%. Marabeni's trying to move in to control the rest. Uh, mm -hmm. So you've got a few little independents operating in the name of the big companies. You tell me that's free enterprise, and I'll put in with you. It's free enterprise monopoly. It's free enterprise monopoly. combine. It's you probably mean. one of the most heavily monopolized industries in Canada. 
Yeah, now if because you could just say, money in that. if you could say you had the solidarity of all the fishing people on the West Coast, you'd be in a much stronger position. But you haven't. If anything, your position is weakened among the number of boats on the coast over the past 25 well, years. Let's, let's answer that. You see, the, the fact is that the, the prices that have been paid, I think it has created some illusions. I don't think anyone would deny that. But I think what we've got to, you know, the realities of the industry are starting to come home, that we've got a situation. You mentioned too, uh, too many boats chasing too few fish. Right. That is a problem that's cut into the earnings, and that's creating problems for the fishermen, big problems. It's creating problems. The licensing system we have is a Frankenstein monster. All right, let's stop right there. I think everybody might agree the licensing system is a Frankenstein monster. I know teachers, policemen, firemen, ferry workers, all of whom are slavering up the mouth with the anticipation of greed and going out on the herring business. Moonlighting is a way of life in your industry, is it not? We Could it be stopped? We had hoped that uh, the original licensing system would eliminate a lot of the moonlighting that characterizes the... Uh, Take away a Canadian's right to, as a free man, to go in and pay for a Class A salmon or a combination license and go out and fish the earth to the water that's to... If it w that, that's if it was necessary to have a They've Class A license. They've taken away your, your right in any event, Jack. In order for you to go out there and take part in the same boat industry, you've got to have a million dollars right now to buy a boat. If you want to buy a gillnet or a troller, you're going to have to have sixty to $100,000 to start off with. Is the trafficking in licenses now? Oh, yes. There's, there's more money in, in buying and selling and speculating on licenses than there is in fishing. How can I buy a million dollar boat if, if I buy a, fi a boat with a five ton capacity and, and scrap it? I can only rebuild another five ton boat. But you can use several boats and pyramid the tonnage and build a sane boat. And the sane boat fleet has increased. It's three times the size of what it was uh, at, okay. the at the start of the licensing, licensing. program. Licensing. I remember when Davis brought in, the, was it Davis who brought in the buy bike scheme? Yes. That surely took a number of boats out of uh, circulation. Yeah. On paper, but it didn't reduce the, the fleet significantly, and it certainly hasn't uh, reduced the catching efficiency of the fleet. It's increased it, in fact, uh, many fold, and uh, that's, the, that's the difficulty. It's of all the ships on the coast, boats on the coast, fish boats, fish boats, of all the fish boats on the coast, how many are owned by companies? Only a small proportion. Theoretically, 12 percent, but uh, there are more than that owned by the companies and uh, a lot of them controlled by the companies. You mean financing? Financial, financial oh, right now, B.C. Packers holds $37 million. They've got $37 million out in loans to fishermen as second mortgages and third mortgages and whatnot. That's one company alone. Well, is that a fair deal? It's like borrowing on an NHA for your house, isn't it? Except oh, that it has stipulations. It has that strings you attached to it. You've got to deliver all your production to that company. But yes. you don't do it, as you yeah. and I both know. Eh? They may or may There's not. more than one way to skin a fish. But Upon pain of foreclosure. If, you, uh, if you're caught doing it, uh, you back is foreclosure. All right, what's the answer? Yeah. What about this Sol Sinclair who brought in another gimmick the other day, a recommendation of a, was it a 2% added value to the catch? Is a, yeah. a license of some kind? Well, it, it's a big disappointment to us, the Sol Sinclair report. It really didn't recognize the heavy capitalization in the industry and what it ultimately is going to do because of this oops, double taxation to fishermen it's going to increase the capitalization because in order to pay the extra money, the extra taxation, fishermen are going to have to put additional gear on. They're going to have to put more capital in order to hopefully catch more fish. And that increases the pressure on the stocks. It, uh, it creates even more problems for the industry. But don't we have uh, various masterminds who sit up in offices in Vancouver and say, Jack, don't fish there. Jack fish Davis here. is a Rhodes Scholar. He came to our convention and told us, look, I know what's good for you fellas. And even if 90% of you are opposed to this licensing plan, we know what's good for you and this is the way it's going to be. And the buyback was a flop. It's The buyback was a flop. The Davis license limitation is a disaster. Well, now, the only way I can get a Class A license is to go out and buy somebody else's boat. That's right. Do I need to have qualifications as a fisherman? None whatsoever. What about a Class B license? Well, it's the same thing. It's, it only has a life expectancy of 10 years. Uh, and so once that 10 years is up, you're out. What about a heading license? Well, you can't buy them now. Uh, the, they just, uh, uh, we're talking of making these licenses transferable, rentable, and whatever. There's about four classes of herring licenses right at the moment. And it's indicative, I think, of the way these things grow up topsy-turvy until finally they're just an absolute mess. Then a guy like Sinclair has to try to un unravel, but he can't. All right, what's the answer? Well, if you were the Minister of Fisheries, a highly unlikely proposition, well, but if you were... I'm not so sure it's so unlikely, maybe maybe not in my lifetime, but uh, in any event, our, well, our well, solution... Well, well, what should I, what what should I tell LeBlanc when he comes here? What should I tell LeBlanc is the answer to the licensing chaos? Tell him the, uh, that he's going to have to move in the direction of taking away the transferability of that license. 
is going to have to move in the direction of putting the license on the individual fisherman and is going to have to move in the direction of making sure that it's only the bona fide fisherman, the person that earns a certain percentage of his income and depends on the fishing industry for a livelihood. Those are the people that he should be interested in protecting. Wipe out the moonlighting. Why? Wipe out the moonlighting. That's right. That's but it's right. not possible, is it? Oh. If you moved in that oh, I direction, think it is. you could. If, uh, if a license was contingent upon a man earning uh, a good uh, percentage of his income from fishing, then it's possible to... What do you think of LeBlanc as fishing minister? Well, in one word or less? Well, if he rated on a scale of 1 to 10, I would say he's probably about 2.3. 2.3. Yeah. I'll tell him that with your compliments. <laughs> Next, we're going to do the border wars. Now we're going to have a session with the gill netters and the trollers after this break. I'll remember to tell my, um, what's his name, LeBlanc, what you said about him. Describe the conservative critic Lloyd Krauss uh, on the fishing industry. Oh, we'll wait till he gets into power and then we'll, you know, we'll let the fishermen decide that. Uh, you know, the herring thing has really got the public's eye, hasn't it? Well, I think it, it, I think it, it really always is happens. a gold rush, isn't it? Well, that's the way I described it in the officer's report to our convention, a gold rush and the Japanese staking their claims on it. The Japanese come over here with large scads of money and sit there and they'll, do they bid against each other? There's, a, there's an element of that, I suppose. There's two I've companies, Marabini, which is the equivalent of Ford Motors, and Mitsubishi, which is like General Motors. They're the same scale, $48 billion in sales. And this is all <coughs> for the roll? Out of them? They make Weston well, look like the corn and well. yeah. Roll, a salmon roll as well as? Well, salmon roll, but now salmon, whole What salmon. is that, an aphrodisiac or something? <laughs> I mean, it must be to pay that much money for it. Well, uh, I don't know. It's never done anything for me, and I eat a fair amount of fish. <laughs> now, okay, seriously. Border wars. Now, <coughs> I know that the southern end of Vancouver Island is a trench that goes down right. below the 49th. And I know that and below the panhandle, and we don't need maps, there's a place called Dixon Entrance, right? right. And apparently you and the American fishermen and the negotiating teams, of which you remember, do you remember too? Well, at times I've been George General. You I can't mean. agree on which is American and which is Canadian well, waters. Oh, I thought you guys always had good relationships. We do. We agree. Uh, you can't agree with right. the Americans. We can't agree with our own government. Uh, that's that's where our problem is. It's not with the Americans. All right. Uh, simply without map. In what way is LeBlanc sabotaging your object? Well, I'm not so sure it's LeBlanc. It's external affairs that handles that. And, let's blame uh, it on LeBlanc. Okay. Let's. LeBlanc can answer for it. Uh, well, number one, the Dixon entrance has always been considered by Canada to be internal Canadian waters. In 1971, we drew closing lines to enclose all that area. And yet in 19, that same year, a Canadian fisherman fishing in that area, which is Canadian waters, were arrested by uh, American authorities and hauled into court and fined for fishing in, uh, in U.S. waters. And Canada sent a mild diplomatic protest but effectively, as a result of that action, we lost jurisdiction over that territory. Today, that's what's being negotiated. Not just that three-mile strip, but now half of Dixon Entrance. They want half of Dixon Entrance. They want half of Dixon And you say, get up to within three miles of your own No, no, line. we're saying all of it's Canadian. The whole thing has always been You're Canadian. You're not even giving them three miles no, off their own coast. The Alaska Boundary Settlement of 1903 settled that as Canadian as an international boundary. Well, why is it an argument? Well, because the U.S. has now suddenly discovered that there's possibly an oil tanker route that could be used. They've discovered the incoming salmon runs. They can be intercepted there very effectively. Who knows? But they've decided that they want three miles south of Cape Nizan and south of those two panhandle capes. How come they can arbitrate <coughs> the East Coast but no arbitration of this well, problem on the West Coast? We're not so sure that that's the uh, solution. They can, and quite frankly, we fear that they may. And you'll lose on an arbitration. And we'll lose in an arbitration. Mm -hmm. uh, that's our track record. They'll carve least. it up in an arbitration. Well, they'll, they'll split the difference. That's the kind of... What the about the... Re <coughs> recently in Juneau, Alaska, took the position there with one of the Canadian negotiators that <coughs> the AB line, so-called, is not negotiable and it's not arbitrable. Uh, it's That's the right. line that divides the land mass between the United States and Canada, and that we ought not to consider arbitrating the thing. If the Americans want to sue us in the world court, let them go ahead and we'll go and defend ourselves. But it's madness, I think, to take it to voluntarily to arbitration because we're going to have the arbitrators deciding whether it's going to be three miles or 12 miles. So they'll go for six. That's right. So what about the southern trench uh, below the tip of uh, Vancouver Island? Well, our position is that we should be maximizing our boundary claims on both coasts in order to strengthen our bargaining position. 
Uh, if we don't get that southern trench, again, there will be the possibility of interception. Right. What's going to happen <coughs> in the fishing season when the salmon begins to run in June, July, and August well, in the these areas? The Americans are already patrolling. Uh, we've lost the battle. We've, we've really lost, uh, de facto, we've, we've, we've lost a thing. Both so, ends, both at Dixon entrance and south well, of Vancouver it's been, Let's put it this way, it's been very seriously prejudiced. We, we say the battle isn't over yet, but uh, in the minds of the government, I think it, it is over, and that's where the you know, that's the sad part of it. It's just a matter of whether they can make the political decisions to They, uh, th they know it's an unpalatable one that people of British Columbia don't want to surrender those territories. I see, I'll uh, be talking to uh, Mike Forrest about this, that you got a slap in the teeth from the Labour Board on that uh, declaratory injunction because you have blacklists. Is this one of the reasons you're in trouble? In the 78th state, you published a blacklist to prevent some of the gillnetters from doing certain things. I and I see the Labour Board came down and said, you're being bad boys, don't do it again, or we may have to issue an order. Hmm. Yeah, I don't recall any. You what? No, it's never been established that we published a blacklist. The blacklists are, I suppose, names of boats that are uh, etched on the minds of fishermen. And uh, this Tell is me, tell me about them. That sounds like a troublemaking area. Well, all right, uh, so f the fishermen are tied up, uh, at least the organized fishermen and others are tied up as a result of a strike. Others go... Your strike. Our strike. Others go fishing. And, and so uh, guys who are not involved in your union... The organized fishermen resent that. And, uh, and you blacklist them. <laughs> well, no, I, their fishermen are working alongside one another, and uh, if you fish during a strike, then uh, the organized fisherman remembers that. The LRB brought down a decision that said that... What happens if a bus driver walks through a bus driver's picket line? Right. What do you think the mood is? We're not talking about bus driver. No, that's what we're we'll talking say, about, bus yeah. driver. I mean, I used to be a left-winger, but look at me now, right? <laughs> we'll say that I go out and I buy myself, uh, huh? what do I buy? A gill net, right? Mm. And I'm catching my salmon peacefully and happily, and I'm doing very well because I've got a good instinct for fish. And you're on strike. Uh, can I sell my catch? Not to organize plants, you can't. Not because to your organize plants. Because the shore workers likely to be on strike. Because you'll well. declare that, oh, if they're on strike, can you declare stuff hot and Well, look, we, we don't believe that any fisherman ought to profit at the expense of the others when uh, the organized fishermen are fighting for better conditions in the fishing Maybe he industry. doesn't believe in your cause. Maybe not, uh, but that doesn't that doesn't stop maybe our the, organized maybe fishermen from resenting their activities. believe in the cause of his trade union either. Uh, uh, you know, the not all strike. Oh, but he's organized and certified. You're not. Well, we're organized. Uh, yeah, organized, they, yes, but and certified. That, no. The interesting thing about that LRB decision is that they're saying that it's too late to turn back the clock. That was the other aspect of it. That's right. They're saying it's too late to turn back the clock. Fishermen do have bargaining rights, and they point the finger at the law and, uh, and say that the law really should. Uh, if it weren't for that situation, fishermen would should okay. codify those rights. Your position, right. Jack, just to get it right, is the United Fishermen and Allied Workers Union, provincially certified for canneries and tenderman has all the normal powers of a trade union in that area. And that in other areas, you believe you have an exemption under the old Competition Act, and you believe you have traditional bargaining rights which allows you to represent and dominate all fishing bargaining on um, the West Coast. But there are, there are legal implications uh, you know, in all of that. First of all, I, I take the position that we are the uh, legitimate bargaining agent for shore workers, tenderman, and fishermen, at least those fishermen that we represent. Right. The Canada Labor Code was, in, was amended to include certain classes of fishermen within the definition of employees. Right. There's a dependent contractor feature in the uh, Provincial Labor Code that Bill King, when he was Minister of Labor, said would include fishermen. We, we have court decisions here. In the Mark Fishing case, the Chief Justice of the Appeal Court in British Columbia decided that, at least in that dispute, the fishermen were, uh, were employees. There was an employer-employee relationship, and that uh, he decided that the jurisdiction for labor relations between fishermen and uh, processors, vessel owners, whatever, is a provincial jurisdiction. So there is the other problem. I see that. But fishermen, <coughs> by and large, don't. A, a guy on a boat doesn't work for mm. wages. Peace no, he, he works piecework. Share work. Piecework. So much yeah, but you have to You have to catch fish in order to share in the, in the value of it. Yeah. Gentlemen, you've been very lucid <coughs> and given me a good exposition. Now, what I'd like to do now, if you'll uh, forgive me, is I'm going to bring in McGee. Not McGee. Forrest, Mike Forrest, and Dick Williams, the Pacific Gillnetters and the Pacific Trollers. <laughs> We're on the air, kill that. After this break. <laughs> This is Len along with Webster Money. I thought both my friends from the Fisherman's Union were very outspoken and very direct. 
Uh, and while not trying to create any confrontation, I have with me Dick Williams, who is the chairman of the international committees of the Pacific Trawlers Association. Now, these are the guys with the, lo the lines and the wires and the hooks. That's right. right. Yeah. It's, uh, and you operate out of where, Victoria? Well, Victoria and you cue it. Um, How many people in your association? Oh, 500 plus. 500 plus? Yeah. Are you all unionized in any way, shape, or form? No, we're all vessel owners, troll vessel owners. And how do you, uh, you, do you have employees or do you have? Deckhands, yeah, on a share basis. On a share basis? Yeah. And you regard yourself as an uninhibited free enterpriser? Very much so, I'm afraid. To, uh, Any kind of government subsidies you can get your hands on? Uh, yes, quite often, as far as uh, we're concerned, there's too many government subsidies. But you take them if you can get them? Uh, some do, some don't. Do you do? Uh, well, the only thing I ever did have, I guess, was a low-interest fisherman's loan, and that's not so low anymore. So. No. We've got Mike Forrest, uh, the president of Pacific Gill Netters Association. You're the guys with nets, right? With one type of net, the gill net, not the seine net. Now, uh, who represents the seine net? The Fisherman's Union? Uh, well, portions of the crew the uh, Fisherman's Union represents, and the vessel owners have a, an organization of their own, which uh, is seen. Now, I tried to get from Jack and George an idea of how many of the people on the, <coughs> on the entire West Coast fishing industry represented. It didn't quite succeed. <laughs> How many people do you represent, the trawlers and the gill netters? Are you, are you a tenth of the industry, a twentieth of the industry, or what? Oh, God. Well, it's very difficult to say. I don't In know. Physical got... numbers, it would be a problem. Yeah, the, the, the uh, production would be a more... Of troll licenses, I guess we represent uh, between a quarter and a third of the troll license holders. Well, in production, what would you represent? You free enterprisers. You unrestricted oh, right. free enterprisers. I wouldn't like Production, to uh, we represent... We uh, feel that we represent the majority of the troll production and uh, you know by that I don't mean 51 percent I think we're probably closer to in the 70 percent bracket. All right, let's go down the line on the issues I raised with the Fisherman's Union. Do you think the Combine's investigation of the Fisherman's Union is necessary or is it merely harassing good fishermen friends of yours? Uh, you know I that's a real touchy subject, but they, they must be looking for something that uh, I don't think that team uh, carries on willy-nilly. That, uh, you know, Christ, they've been grinding away the there for, well... Well, no, let me put it to you another way. Do you think that there should be a body which negotiate? Do you negotiate prices for the gill netters? No. Do you negotiate prices for the trawlers? We have never negotiated prices. Isn't it a good thing that somebody negotiates and puts the hammer on these big boys like, uh, what's the name, BC Packers, Canfisco, Western and Company, I think to bring up the prices? In the past, the union's done a good job at that. I think at the present time, I think that's outlived its necessity. Uh, we have so many cash buyers and so many people willing to buy the fish, even the public out there, that there's not no need for, uh, it seems at this time, for a... Uh, base price or collective bargaining situation for gill netters, per se. Well, this Dick. is, you know, they, they uh, you know, go through a, a ritual of negotiating a price, and uh, they wind up with a w minimum price agreement. Uh, I, f I forget the figure was mentioned here this morning of what, 12? 1250 $1 $1 a ton. 1250 a ton. I think they had a, an opening in uh, Naden Harbor already, the, up in the Charlottes, and the price was 1750 a ton. It's been paid there. San Francisco Harbor, the price on roll herring, it hit $2,000, and that's U.S. dollars. So, uh, all to the Japanese market. Why the hell go through a Punch and Judy show of negotiating a, a minimum price agreement uh, at 1250 That There, you know, uh, there does have to be something established on SANES because uh, the SANE cruise share is based on a negotiated price. But there seems to be a problem there of their negotiating with the processors when. The guy running the boat, the same vessel owner, is the one that should be arguing about price. And then the crew on that boat should be arguing with him about crew share. Yeah, but you do admit there's need for negotiation to protect the same crews from getting done in the eye. 
Yeah, but I, I think the the wrong people, uh, you know, are involved in the fish price negotiation. The thing isn't taking place on the right level. That vessel owner, if uh, he feels that he wants to negotiate a price, he should be negotiating a price. That crewman should be battling it out with the vessel owner as to crew share. Well, I suppose so. Now, um, you say the market is so good just now, the prices will find their own level. Yes. That's okay when times are good, but next year they might ban herring fishing altogether because you've cleaned the damn thing out. That's true, but the and even, then what? even the uh, negotiated price is not going to stop that. There's no way that uh, Canadian Fish or BC Packers or whoever the other numbers of buyers are will uh, support a price if they can't make a dollar at the industry. So if it's negotiated and they find that the Canadian dollar changes its value or the <coughs> yen changes its value and the, or the Japanese market finds some other supply, then the Canadian uh, herring fishery for Gilnet and Seine will be a, a problem to find a, a sale point for their product. Your and position is that you go out and fish for herring or whatever it is. And you come and back and you dick over the price or you sell to a cash buyer in a packing boat, who, no matter whose. Yes. And deliver it then and there. Is that right? Yes. On the grounds, this isn't a procedure that comes back anywhere. This is all done on the grounds and a lot of hurry yeah. and hassle. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about the border wars? Do you care about the border wars? Are well, you we've been, the border wars? yeah, we've been very much involved in it. Uh, in fact, I guess we led in it uh, initially. Um, and, uh, what questions George, would you like me to put to Romeo LeBlanc this week? Is he let, letting the site <coughs> down? Uh, I think he's got a, a certainly a problem of external affairs is overriding the interest of the, the fishing industry in uh, the boundary settlements and negotiations. Uh, we, uh, right from, uh, well, in Jack Davis's era, uh, were very interested in the, the Juan de Fuca Canyon as the, the boundary instead of a median line. Uh, we were told at that time that it would be over the dead body of external affairs that we'd ever see it, and uh, they're probably right, but uh, just because they said it don't mean I'm going to agree with them. Why would they take that angle? Have we always fished that canyon? That well, trench. we fished the prairie ground down to the canyon and in the canyon, certainly, to a large degree. Uh, we developed the fishery there. Um, Are they Canadian uh, fish in there? Canadian yes, salmon there's a up good, uh, well, it's a certain, uh, you know, the troll fishery out there, which is what it is. It's a troll fishery. It's a very, you know, and it is a mixed fishery, mixed stock fishery. Sure, there's Canadian fish there. But, uh, anyway, the external affairs are determined to give away that trench south of Vancouver Island for well, some strange reason you to, can't find out why. To be neat and tidy, they took this bloody median line concept and they applied that to all boundaries uh, in, that were counted. How about the Hackett Straits? Do you people go up as far as the Dixon entrance? Yes, we do, but we're not an offshore fishery. The gillnet fishery is an inshore fishery and the trollers are the, the offshore types that are uh, mostly involved in this. Uh, You're quite happy to leave that particular barney to the Fisherman's Union. Well, I think in, in uh, times the Fisherman's Union has done a fine job in the, the bargaining over borders. I don't agree with them at all times, that's for sure, but it, uh, in cases in the past they have done a, a fairly good job. Okay, I want to talk some more with Dick Williams of the Trollers and uh, Mike Forrest of the Gilnetters after this commercial break. <laughs> I skated around with George and Jack Nichol and your problem of the blacklist. You tell me your version of the blacklist and if uh, you're happy with the, the potential declaratory injunction you got from the Labour Board which said that there were bad boys should stop these lists and shouldn't do it again. What happened? Well, they had a strike for their union people and uh, we fished for ourselves and didn't cross any picket lines and sold to non-union buyers and uh, in our mind didn't have any we weren't to be controlled by uh, an outside union and we consider ourselves to be independent uh, fishermen as such anyway the the union sought to try to control us and did it did so through blacklists and <coughs> the result of it though very late in the affairs because we're now just running into herring came to us on february the 20th from the lrb handed down there uh, not a declaration but uh, a, a statement. reprimand you might say I, yes. To the union. Now, what had happened? I mean, if you, if you were fishing non-union during a strike and selling to non-union buyers, how could anybody affect you? Well, 
Mm -hmm. what, did they, what did they allegedly do to make life difficult with the blacklist? Through, through their control <coughs> of uh, shore workers and tendermen, they were able to uh, cut our trans some of the transport of fish facilities, some of the uh, uh, facilities on at dockside that we otherwise would have enjoyed the use of were cut off. Uh, they ran, of course, picket boats, or they called them picket boats, run around in amongst the fleet and holler names at you and uh, tell you the consequences that you're going to run into if you continue to fish. And you regard that this is uh, unfair harassment of the wash order? Yes. And it's the, the order which you showed me this morning says, we hope the publication of this thing, or this warning, will mean that they will terminate these blacklists and this behavior. Yes. If it happens again, you'll go to the court for an official, the court, the labor board for an official order. Is that right? I sure hope we don't have to, but we will. What about salmon? You're a salmon fisherman, aren't you? Yeah. No problems in that, apart from the boundary troubles. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> well, not for the last couple of years. Uh, we run into problems every so often, certainly with uh, the uh, union uh, decides to withdraw its services, and uh, of course this stops our operation. Uh, normal operation. Uh, Don't you take your stuff down to Seattle and sell it that's sometimes? That's right, usually to Bellingham. That uh, We run our own fishing operation into Bellingham. No problems there? Uh, as yet, no. All right, licensing. It's very difficult for a layman like hmm. myself to understand what should be done about licensing. Now, you're a free enterprise at the soles of your boots. You've been fishing for 30 years. Do you want to see all these moonlighters continue to fish? The firemen, the ferry workers, the policemen, the school teachers, you know, anybody with enough money to buy a boat. You want to see them fit or do you want I to see the licenses uh, restricted? I think the, the license uh, program is kind of, you know, it's bloody haywire. Um, it needs uh, a lot of cleaning up. Uh, I don't uh, see as uh, annihilating licenses is going to help uh, at all, uh, certainly ain't going to help me as a rampant redneck free enterpriser that... Uh, you don't care who gets a license? <laughs> well, I think the license uh, holder should uh, really uh, be paying more than he is for a license and be paying more towards uh, maintenance or improvement of the resource. Well, I thought your licenses uh, in the Davis days went up like uh, skyrockets, and now that well. Salt Sinclair <coughs> recommends a 2% uh, levy of some kind on the value of your catch, doesn't it? Yeah, he's uh, that not enough? at a 2% royalty. Uh, well, we haven't really had a chance to look at that Sinclair report. I don't doubt, uh, you know, the majority of fishermen, uh, just like any taxpayer, is going to say no bloody way when it comes to paying more taxes. But you don't feel that you've been overcharged for your li fishing, li fishing license fees? Yeah, absolutely How not. How do you feel? About the same. I, I feel that as a resource user, we should be paying resource rent. And whether the 2% is correct or not, and uh, where the money actually goes <coughs> is disputable. but. The idea of resource rent is a good one. Uh, it's only fair that if we're going to use the resource, we pay for it. Okay, as a gillnetter, now you operate as a, a, a you operate as vessel, vessel owners with crews on share. Yes, mostly it's one person. Though the restriction in time is such that any person on, by himself can do a 12-hour or a 24-hour fishery. You don't have to have two or three people. Yeah, but you go out alone. A lot of times. So you can get everything you catch, you make. It's yours. Well, except pay for your <laughs> boat in one season. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Bank. No, not really at all. Uh, paying for the boat in one season is a, a past uh, tense item. We don't have any uh, possibility of gaining that whatever it's sixty to $100,000 amount in the course of a year now. We don't have sufficient time to do it. There and the herring's a bonanza. Well, herring is also a risk. Uh, it's a bonanza if you happen to get the fish, but the time problem, the lack of time to go and fish those fish. If you have any single thing go wrong, you have an engine breakdown, mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, sickness for some reason that you can't work for a couple of days, it's a matter of a couple of days. It isn't a whole long three-month, four-month fishery. What's the crew in a trawler? Uh, oh, I think the average is something like 2.4, so that would be the 1.4 crew, eh? that, uh, the skipper. Well, and let's uh, say one three. The, all right, call let's it say three. three. How much money will a good trawler crew member make in a good year? Oh, I guess my deckhand is making, and I generally just take the one, he's uh, around twelve to 15000 For how much work? 
for what four and a half, five and a half months. He goes on UIC. After yeah. that, yeah. Danny, let's hope not. Well, even a lot of them, the lot of them do. Yeah, a lot of them do. Uh, some of them that uh, you know work elsewhere. That always annoyed the devil out of me. Well, at uh, UIC. <laughs> Well, I removed myself from it. I'm eligible for UIC, too. To You're to not taking it. it? No. No, sir. You're not a decent Canadian. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, this is... You're entitled uh, to it. you got to take it. <laughs> <laughs> is that right? <laughs> well, um, I... Uh, anyway, you've got... You, on licensing, you were saying that... Uh, well, did you say that you don't... That, that you pay more licenses and you would let the cost of the license be the restriction on the numbers? Well, I think it, uh, you know, should have a bearing on it. Uh, that. Uh, what would you do about these moonlighters? They're free enterprises like you. You wouldn't stop right. them, would you? That, uh, well, it's the same. You know, we have a problem with uh, Mike's group, uh, the gill netters, eh? and they get cut down on time. The trollers, we got practically unrestricted time, the 15th of April to the 31st of October. That's so we salmon. That's right. And so the gill netters, they've developed into a, what we call a combination boat. They gill net and they troll. And uh, sure, we get quite upset with them. That, uh, they're still in your fish. Well, that, <laughs> they're double sharing, eh? That it's, their, it's their fish as much as it is mine. You don't want to stop uh, them, though? Uh, yeah, on the combination thing, I want to stop them. That, you know, I'd like to see the licensing thing cleaned up as far as gear types. But if that guy wants to go trolling, by all means, that uh, competition is uh, on the ground, no problem. Tell you what I'm going to do now, gentlemen. I'm going to bring back uh, Nick, Jack Nickel and George Houston, two of you here, two of you here, and we're going to take phones from fishermen on the problems of the industry. Well, I'm looking for telephone calls right now, I tell you very frankly, on the subject of uh, the fishing industry. And we've covered the boundary wars, we've covered <coughs> a bit of the herring, we've covered the combines investigation, we've covered the man who calls themselves, what do you call yourself, a redneck free enterprise? Rampant redneck, rampant free, redneck free, free enterprise. I forgot the first R. <laughs> That's right, a rampant redneck free enterprise. <laughs> and uh, as you know, we've got gill netters, trawlers, and the big boys, UFAWU. Rampant red tree genius. Rampant. <laughs> These days are gone. No more of that red baiting. I won't have any red baiting from you, Jack Nickel. That's a disgraceful thing to say. Go ahead, please. I'm a vessel owner. Yes, ma'am. I've been in the industry for 35 years. Uh huh. I'm a member of the Fisherman's Union, the UFAWU. Uh huh. And I have to say that uh, the only problem that we really had uh, this last season, our son was also out fishing on another gill netter. And he got rammed by the people that were scabbing, and he got pushed around, and uh, I didn't think very kindly about it. I, that's free enterprise. I, I don't want any part of that kind of free enterprise. When you fish during the strike, you regard yourself as a scab. I would I regard people that fish during the strike and who take advantage of different flags of convenience, I call them. They were, some of them were uh, members of the, of the co-op, and when it's a strike on in the co-op, then they fish for BC Packers or Canadian Fish or vice versa. And is that right, George? They're trying to be all things to all people. That's, that's true. Strike on in the co-op. Isn't that the native co-op? No, no, I don't. I mean the Prince Rupert co-op. She's talking about people that jump around in order to avoid strikes and in order to avoid the responsibilities to you know, Not your members, fight sure. for better prices. Well, some of them are and some of them aren't. I, I'm sure most of them aren't her members. You know, if the Prince Rupert the co-op goes on strike, they move their boat somewhere else and Go fish to for somebody. Packers or Go to BC, BC Packers. Packers. That's generally what it is, Jack. The the members of the Prince Rupert Fisherman's Co-op who are gill netters usually don't have packer service, so in the normal course of events, they deliver to company packers. When there's a strike on, then they all of a sudden become a, a co-op fisherman and want to continue to fish. Anything wrong with that? That's exactly it. Just a minute, anything wrong with that, Mike? To, be, to change into a co-op fisherman, I don't think that's a good plan. I think if you're going to be a co-op fisherman, you stay stay that way. and Stay with them. Way. You're going to be independent, you uh, yeah. do that, and you stay stick with it. You stick with your guns. The people that jump around are not... Uh, uh, you're not that keen on them. I'm not in favor. But of you that don't accept of. the definition of scab that she puts on you because you fish no, when they're on strike. Scab's a union term, and I'm not a union person and not involved with that case. So. Go ahead from Prince Rupert. Prince Rupert, are you there? Oh, it's that thing for the wrong line, I'm sorry. Go ahead from Prince Rupert. He's completely wrong. The Prince Rupert co-op fishermen don't jump around. 
when there is a lockout or a strike in the other union, the co-op fishermen are, or when there's a strike at the co-op, the co-op fishermen are not allowed to uh, take in any new members. And uh, any co-op fisherman has nothing to do with the other union whatsoever. Okay, are you a fisherman or a shore worker? I'm a fisherman, and I don't consider that the UFAWU represents any great part of the fishermen on this coast at all. There's dozens of other groups that fish and have nothing to do with the UFAWU. Also, there's a clarification point there. And they, we talk about, when we talk about co-ops, uh, there are so many on the coast now. To the fishermen, it means one thing, and to the public, it means another. There are a number of them, and it's not just the Prince Rupert Fisherman's Co-op. There are, uh, there's a Steveson Co-op. There are several smaller co-ops set up. Uh, you can't say co-op and come up with one group. It has, it's a whole bunch well, of groups. Let me just say something on that, Jack. We don't pretend and haven't pretended to represent the fishermen in the co-op. They're a large independent. They represent about 11% of the production on the coast. Prince Rupert Co-op. The Prince Rupert Co-op. They're probably the you know, the last vestige of real free enterprise in the in the industry, if there is such a thing. And even there, there's a question of marketing, that they there's certain realities they've got to deal with. Uh, but certainly it's not true to say that there aren't co-op fishermen, because we've had numerous instances in almost every strike situation where there have been people that either see a pending strike and switch over, or the situation last year where the shore workers in the co-op plant went on strike, and we had instances where they were trying to get their fish unloaded at Union Packers. That was a fact. So I don't think it's uh, the other co-ops. Well, we have a situation where heavy financing is coming from outside the industry, from companies like we were talking, Marabeni, for instance, issuing debentures. Uh, you know, and certainly that's one of the means by which these large companies are trying to break into the industry. Anything wrong with that? Are you afraid of the Japanese taking over the industry here? Not really. I think uh, one thing that the Japanese investment has done, that uh, the dinosaur called the Fisheries uh, uh, Association of BC is going to have to wake up to the realities of competition. That uh, all of a sudden they don't have an exclusive uh, set of cards for the game. And is that not good news for everybody, the well, Japanese coming in? The, I don't, the know, competition I, thing is, is yeah, probably I, I uh, have to, is a good aspect. There's somewhere in this the line has got to be drawn. All right, you know, I, th I think that uh, the industry needs uh, a shot in the arm to get some competition and wake these guys up. But uh, you know, when you see the, you look at the Canadian dollar versus the Japanese yen, and they start, they're just pumping it in, you know, the way they are. Well, then you've got to get a bit nervous. But the competition side of it, by but Jesus, Jack, they if we're, it. we're if we're as fishermen, not going to end up like the dinosaur ourselves. You see, I think we have to look a little bit ahead. And when you see the kind of competition, it's like competition between corner groceries. Once the competition comes to an end, once the war on the grounds for fish prices is over, then what happens is we know we're going to be the meat in the sandwich as fishermen. That's you're not, you're not telling situation. me that BC Packers can be out bought by Matabini. They're Mitsubishi. going to have to come to an accommodation or somebody's going to go under. One, one or the other will go under in this fish war. Maybe the fish will go under. As long as we don't that's come up the, with some kind of a marketing situation. board or something, we're still going to be able to go out there and hustle our fish and be able to sell them to Joe Public as well. And even though that's going to be a detriment to our ability to continue, uh, we can do that and that's open to us to, to try. Well, I think, Jack, uh, if I may, there there is a difference between a Japanese market and the prices that our fish products uh, can command on the Japanese market. And uh, I think we can exploit those markets without heavy doses of Japanese capital coming in and taking over the industry. That's where I draw the line. Yeah, I think uh, we're all kind of agree you're all kind of agreed in that, that the Japanese entry into the competitive market to buy fish on the grounds is good. But if they're going to buy up every plant in the country, well, that's bad. There's also a couple of negative things. Number one is the price, finally, that the consumer has to pay for the product. Uh, you know, you've got sockeye salmon now selling for $9.50 a pound in Japan. Obviously, that's not good. We talk about the, you know, the resource belonging to the public, and yet the public can't afford to buy salmon. The other thing, of course, is the long-term impact in terms on marketing and jobs. Uh, and that certainly has to be of concern to all Canadians. Just a minute, when you when you destroy your canning industry and put all your fish you just exported holus bolus to Japan, uh, mm -hmm. the long term effect you destroy that traditional market that we've had. Well, great entirely. Uh, are you getting much? You getting from? Are you selling salmon to Japanese? Uh, indirectly, I guess. Indirectly, I guess. Yeah. That, are they uh, liable to appear this year with cash buyers and do the well, same with salmon that they'd, they've done with the herring? Well, they were heavy. They uh, really put the bump on sockeye prices last year on uh, fresh frozen. 
uh, sockeye product. Uh, they wanted a high quality product. That's good for I, you. Oh yes. You sold uh, to them. Yes, for trollers, that uh, the majority of uh, the troll production on troll cock sockeye uh, fitted into that market. And now with the new sports regulations, we've got to throw back everything under 18 inches. <laughs> we want the, the common people won't be eating salmon at all, will they? Oh, no, Jack. Come on. Come on. You'll sell it to the Japanese. Huh? You'll not sell it to the Japanese. Not under 18 inches. My size limit's 26. No, I'm not talking about size limits. But, I mean, if you can sell every salmon you catch to the Japanese for $9.50 a pound well, or whatever. With the People aren't going to get canned salmon in Britain, uh, that's for sure. They won't be able to pay the price there. Fresh frozen to Italy, Japan. France. The right traditional now. markets are going to have to be abandoned. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good yeah. question as to where that actually arises, though. I mean, it, at some point, we have to say, okay, enough's enough, and we're not going to go for more, more money. But... Also, we have to have come up with less. Uh, Are you going to say that when uh, the president of the station offers you more money? You're going to say, no, I don't want more money? Yeah. <laughs> you've got to look a gonna gift horse in the mouth. Money. That's the point. Uh, and you've got to see where that money's shooting for and what the purpose is. And if you're only getting $2 a pound, our membership got $1.50 a pound last year for sockeye salmon. Give me that, $1.50. They sold it for $1.50 on the grounds, basically, or even less. In many cases, it was only $1.50. And it was sold in Japan for? nine fifty, and in some cases, $10 a pound. That was U.S. funds. So we're, we're dealing with a tremendous markup, and that's why all this capital is But the one thing, Julian agreed with our old uh, rampant redneck free enterpriser over here, that you don't want a marketing board. Oh, oh no, no, no. Nobody. That's, that's Nobody. not the answer. Move no. unanimously carried. At least yeah. no marketing board. Know, you know, Webster one. <laughs> and my fishing friends <laughs> after this break. <laughs> one thing I forgot to put to you, gentlemen, is the 200-mile limit. Now, I realize that the traditional fishing grounds between Canada and the States are the subject of the present kerfuffle. What is it? Is it 200 mile an hour limit in now, and is it effective? Well, it's it's in effect aside yeah. from the boundaries. Uh, you know, the, the certainly the areas. Part of it is uh, we've established that it's the up and down where we're having the arguments. But does that mean that the big Korean draggers and the Russian draggers and the Japanese draggers are now no longer off our shores? Well, not necessarily, yeah, but uh, we can tell them to get out if we so decide. Well, the but drag fleet, really, the, the, you know, the offshore drag fleet that we used to have, you know, Soviets, Koreans, and all that, they, I don't <coughs> think we have any of them. We do have, there is some licenses issued on, uh, for long line fish, black cod, rockfish, and that, but I don't think there's a... a so the 200 mile limit is not fish. a big issue, is it, Jack? That's right, yeah. Well, yes, it's a big issue. We've, as a union, called for that for years, uh, precisely for the reason that we want to exploit you know, develop our, our fisheries resources in the best interests of Canada and not have pelagic fleets from other nations fishing offshore and taking stocks that we could well exploit. You mean you want uh, BC Packers and uh, <laughs> Can Fisco to develop these pelagic fleets? Or whoever. Yeah, you want to negotiate good, on behalf of the yeah, whole good industry? Good, solid Canadian companies like BC Packers citizens. and uh, yeah. Canadian Fishing <laughs> Company, good corporate citizens. We want them to develop it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think people quite so saw we. It. We're not concerned. Uh, uh, what we're mainly concerned with is that Canadian fishermen, Canadian shore workers, are the ones that are going to develop our our resources in the best interest of the fishing industry. Go ahead, please, caller. I'm a branch market, you. No, oh, none of that. Yeah, there's no money in the Gaelic. See your point or hang up. Uh, I'm gonna hide. Heard rumors that there was a, a, a formula by LeBlanc to repurchase all the licenses of boats back and licensing heavily the fishermen and then licensing each type of gear on a boat. That would, that would, that would give you a control. If you have three types of gear, he pays three licenses. You're saying that th there was a formula whereby LeBlanc was thinking about repurchasing all licenses, reissuing them, and reissuing licenses for three types of gear. Is that right? But you, know, you had about that, John. Well, this is the recent uh, Saul Sinclair report. It's some of the philosophy ah, that yeah. he is developing, and uh, quite frankly, we oppose much of what he is recommending. If they did that, it would take the boat licenses out of the canneries. It would be possible you'd rent a boat from the cannery, but the licensed fisherman would be the one that would control the action of the boats. That's one thing. Are you a fisherman? I certainly am. I've been the long line and on halibut and saying everything, Jack, old timer. Good. One other point. The sports fishermen that are getting a, a hell of a cream of the of the troll fish here, we know that the number of fish that they're turning in is far more than what they should because I, we have neighbors that buy fish from them. We know this is happening. When they brought in the downrigger, the downrigger, that 
was the one that made it very difficult to compete with them for the average troller. You talking about sports fishermen? That's right. They're using a downrigger gear now that creams the uh, the heavy. Caught them how? Another point. If these unions are so bad at the canneries, why do the and the uh, control, uh, shore workers? Why are they picking up fish from the as they would call them scab and un uh, un uh, 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 organized. Are you suggesting to me, and I'm going to ask the fellas here, that there is competition to the commercial fishing industry from those with no ordinary sports licenses who use downriggers with the big handles on them and sell it to the plants in competition commercially? No, they're selling, no, selling them locally, Jack. But I'm talking now, another point would be that the people that are buying the fish, they'll take fish off of any boat that will sell them a fish. Okay, let's, uh, let's ask... Uh, Mike, first of all, Mike, are you in danger of competition from guys who on a sport license? Yes. How about you? Because of the restriction in the number uh, of fish. No, I think we. It's the same. It's a part of the same argument. Eh? Too many fishermen chasing too many fish, and part of the, the fish. fisherman compliment is the recreational side and uh, the downrigger thing. Hell, I think that's the one of the best things the recreational side ever developed. That at least if they catch a fish, it's a decent sized fish. It's not. Uh, this garbage that they're fishing, well, this 12-inch size limit thing, you know, that it gets them out of that. It's not a problem for the union, is it? Well, it's a problem for everyone, but it's it's a symptom rather than the, the you know, something that's fundamental. It's a symptom of the fact that you've got, uh, you know, fish selling for the prices that it has, and other right. the people in Canada can't afford to buy fish. And so if somebody comes along uh, that offers them that, whether it's bootlegged or whatever it is, then... Uh, they'll buy it. They'll buy it, and that's that's a problem that we've got if we've... The fisheries department is trying to address itself, and it's quite frankly they're fighting a losing battle. Anyway, you made your fortune and retired, did you? I would, I would disagree with the caller that uh, the plants would pick up that fish. I don't think no. the companies would be no. touching it. This, these are direct sales to the public, but what it really is, is an abuse of the sports fishing privilege, where you have a pseudo uh, commercial operation. Com sport. Here, here. What do you call it? Com sport. Did you sell your license yet? No, oh, I'm fishing again. Another point, Jack. Now, how much is your boat worth? Oh, it's not worth much. I've got a B license for two years more. Oh. That dies on them, does it? Yeah. I want to make here is this. If some of these boats with these downrigger gear were policed and inspected, they would find that they're not fishing them as they were supposed to be fished with a snap on the bottom to release the line and play the fish by rod. Oh. Some of these boats have as many as two and three uh, uh, stubbers on there as well. We're going to be here for Okay, hours no, on that. enough of that. Much obliged. <laughs> I must go out fishing with a downrigger sometime. I might, might, I might catch a bleeding fish. <laughs> yeah, you just Where? Might. Abbotsford, go ahead, please. Well known fishing grounds in Abbotsford. <laughs> go ahead, please. Shayless <laughs> River. Where are you? Hello. Yeah. Okay. I got two questions to ask. Number one, why did the Fishermen's Union stop? In 1975, the Alibut fishing, the Alibut fishermen from fishing during the salmon strike. It had nothing to do with salmon. Number two question: uh, What did the fishermen's union do with the money that they made selling fish direct to the public during the strike? Which strike was that? 75? 1975. Well, Jack Nichol, the president. The answer to the the first question is that. Uh, we only stopped those vessels that were combination boats. If they were fishing halibut and uh, were also salmon vessels, then they had to tie up. The, uh, those that were just longliners were able to continue to fish and deliver their uh, production into foreign ports. That was a decision about your own membership. Right. That's right. As far as the uh, money is concerned that was raised during our strike relief salmon fishing operations in 1975, uh, strike expenses were paid from that. Much of it went into strike relief. and. Uh, that's all been reported to several conventions completely uh, to the membership in a, in a comprehensive way. Go ahead from Prince Rupert. Yes, uh, just uh, several points that I wanted to touch on. Uh, one was the, the uh, question, uh, the position by Mr. Roberts, I believe, from the PTA that uh, Sam and crew, uh, same crewmen should negotiate directly with their skippers. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Williams, Dick Williams. I'm sorry. As we call him in the industry, Wick Dilliams. <laughs> Go on. Yes, uh, the point uh, is this, that uh, Mr. Uh, Williams and, and uh, Mr. Forrest, both of them are trying to present some uh, new concept of economic realization, it seems, when in fact what they're doing is going over old ground. The 
the shares between St. Crewmen and their skippers that one time were negotiated between crew and skipper, and you had any number of variables which would be involved in the collection of that money, whose relative you were, whose fence you had painted in the winter time, how much work you had done on the man's boat. It was uh, with the inception of the union contract that uh, that was uh, eradicated and that finally there was a constant level and rate of pay uh, to the crewmen. The second point is this, uh, I find naive the, impl the inference uh, on behalf of uh, both the troller and the gillnetter guests uh, that they prefer to remain independent. The fact of the matter is, and if they would be prepared to admit to you quite honestly, that they use the facilities which are uh, have certifications with the USAWU almost continuously uh, when there is not a strike on, and that is to ensure that they receive some of the, many of the benefits from the companies, such as movement of nets and what have you. And when there is a strike on, then they demand their right to be independent. What He's accusing you of living off the backs of the union. <laughs> I'm afraid not. I own shares in uh, my own fish company. Uh, there's 29 of us in it. Uh, it's a non-union plant, and uh, we. Uh, market our fish uh, production for the year to a, a non-union uh, processor uh, but the only union involvement is the ferry between the Nimo and uh, yeah, but what he's Bay. saying is that a number of so-called independent fishermen are quite willing to live off the backs of the union for other things negotiated by the union do you regard that as a fact uh, well in most in most cases in the strike the that's what the whole issue before the LRB uh, was that uh, do you have benefits for your fishing members? Of course. Well, min as. minimum price agreements. Minimum price agreements. In the case of the same crewmen, we have share arrangements to govern the share between the crew and the owner of the boat. Compensation we have, coverage? We have welfare plans which pay death benefits, shipwreck benefits, sick benefits, uh, those types of things. Compensation? Well, we've, uh, we've established uh, compensation. That was a campaign by the union that established compensation and unemployment insurance. And your people are covered by compensation, oh, yeah. too. Yeah. Universally <laughs> At no. great cost, uh, I might add, uh, on that compensation. That, uh, my cost of compensation, which was voluntary prior to uh, Mr. King bringing, bringing it in, um, was well, he brought quite it reasonable. in provincially. He brought yes. in provincial well, right. WCB is a provincial. The yeah, buyers of the fish now have to pay the premiums yeah. for the for the compensation. compensation. Hold Before your breath, gentlemen. It used to have to be paid by the fishermen. I'm going to ask you to wrap up on LeBlanc and the crises and the chaos and all the rest of it uh, after this break. <laughs> the Jack Nichols of the UFAW. Uh, what's the, uh, when this Combine's investigation completes a report, what happens? What could happen to your union? There could be fines imposed, uh, depending on what they find. There could be jail sentences. There could simply be, like they did in the United States, a permanent prohibition uh, of uh, the activities of the union there. Uh, they sort of waived the idea of fines. They did impose fines, jail sentences, but then said, we won't collect uh, as long as you behave yourself, and of course the union, because it was unable to function, it just simply blew apart. Dick, do you want to see that happen to him? Not really. I think there's certainly, there's definitely a place in the industry for the union. You know, everybody's entitled to uh, get together to uh, protect, <laughs> you know, to further their best interests. But, uh, you know, we look, uh, well, at the, the advisory council that's just set up. There's 14 organizations represented there. Is this there's cooperatives, there's trollers, there's gill netters. In fact, there's a couple of groups of trollers. There's brotherhood. You know, everybody's there, eh, from within the industry. The majority of those organizations there didn't develop to protect themselves from the corporate monster called the Fisheries Association of BC. We developed to protect ourselves from some hurt or other that we was implied or we felt from the UFAWU. So, there's got to be something. <coughs> but yeah, I gather you don't like the Fisheries Association very much. Well, I'm not in love with them. No, I'm not in love with Jack either. <laughs> I live with them. Thanks. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> when do you go fishing? When do we go? Fishing? When do you go out yourself? Whenever the fishery department decides to let us. But on herring, it may be next Sunday or just after. We have to be sitting on the grounds for herring, waiting uh, the chance to jump on the bandwagon and fish for two days or one day or however many. If you're lucky, though, you, you'll pick up twenty thousand bucks in ten days. You have to be very lucky. Could be done, though, couldn't it? Could be. He says two thousand dollars a ton of American in San Francisco. Too, uh, Jack. Listen, I don't hear. Are you guys still drawing unemployment insurance? I don't. Uh, I may be. No, no, but the fishermen. He's fishermen, certainly they do. <laughs> yeah, certainly. They do. Not right, is it? <laughs>
Well, it's right uh, under certain circumstances. There's lots wrong with the way they do it. It's like WCB and the cost of it. You know, if they'd listen to us, uh, then uh, it would be right. Well, the, whole, the whole unemployment insurance scheme, as we proposed it, uh, was an intelligent way of compensating a fisherman for perhaps uh, you know, having a bad a, an year. engine breakdown, a bad year or something of that kind, and they just went wild and paid everybody. It doesn't matter if you make $125,000 a year, you can collect. But isn't it this year that over 18000 or something they're going to tax it back? That's right. It's uh, no, as of no, January 1st. Now. Yeah, yeah, but they, it's even yeah, harder. They're going to tax your your uh, UIC benefits at a, at a certain rate. That's right. Well, gentlemen, I'm grateful for your presence this morning. Mike Forrest, Pacific Gill Netters. Dick Williams, Pacific Trawlers. Jack Nickel, President of the USVWU. And George Hewison, the Secretary. Uh, Fair amount of light for me. It means when Romeo LeBlanc comes in here one morning this week, I'll tell you in a minute when that is. I'll be in a better position to have at him and understand what he's trying or trying not to do. Thank you, gentlemen. A break. Thank you, Jake. Romeo, Romeo, where for art thou, Romeo? When? Thursday. That's Romeo LeBlanc. Yes. Well, that's the day after tomorrow. That's right. Isn't it? Tomorrow we've got what? Pierre Camus. Chairman of CRTC and Grace McCarthy. Oh, and the new gain rates. Yeah. The explanation of everything. That was a good program this morning. I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. And I'll be back tomorrow morning with the Webster Show at 9 a.m. precisely.